to write shell scripting because it crashes again. Um, maybe anyone in the room have another computer where I could buy slides on to try? Anything or like that? Yeah. Just need to put it on. The Don't know if I think this is well my computer so. First of all, Groovy is cool. I hope you agree. The other thing is, because I can. And the third thing is, if you want to do really complex stuff on shell level, um, you very often want to have something like Groovy, a real programming language. And you don't, don't want to have to haggle with awk and all these, and set and all these styles, this stuff. Therefore, Groovy is a real power tool. And you have the possibility to have unit testing or integration testing of your scripts on, on the, your local machine, your shell scripts. So, and you have all the power of the Java world. Or if, like me, if you're better in writing Groovy than Bash code, then this is well a logical choice for that. A word from, uh, about me. My name is... Alexander Klein or Sasha, almost, almost anyone is calling me Sasha, even, even my parents. Sasha is the Russian um, nickname of Alexander, so even Sir Alexander had been called Sasha by his grandma, so this is common way in the eastern area, so if someone's calling me Alexander, it could be that I will not recognize it, that you want to mean, uh, tell something to me. So I'm principal consultant at Codecentric in Germany, we're doing consulting stuff all over the Java, Java virtual machine or in the Java area. My main part is Groovy and all the Groovy community environment, all this stuff, and the user experience and UI world is mine, beside normal standard Java and other stuff. I'm committed in Groovy, and yeah, if you want to know something about me, you will find some stuff about me. So about executing Groovy scripts. How could you do that? It's, it's simple. As if, if you can know Groovy, just execute Groovy executable, Groovy test.groovy. But if you want to have a more integrated way how you would do it normally in your um, environment, Linux, Mac OS, OS, or something like that, you normally want to just do write, in this case, test, and it should run. And you can do something like that by using the shebang command. In Groovy, if the first line of a script is a hash sign, or a hash sign and an ampersand, then this is treated as a comment. It only works in the first line. So what you can do, and this is the, hash, the shebang command that is as well used for Linux, macOS, and so on. Um, for executing an executable on this file. So you can do that by just using there, specifying your local path or your path to Groovy, where it's, res it's residing on your file system. This means execute this file with this executable. Um, but it, if you want to share your scripts, you don't always have Groovy in the same location as here in the user local Groovy. So on most systems, process-based systems, you have these env command. It's normally used in, uh, located in user bin env. So you can use that, and it will find the Groovy for your for itself. You have the possibility to add some interesting stuff to that. For example, command line arguments, like the class path. 
minus CP of these crew V and then any jar files. This means you're just adding this to the jar file and do it like you, you can do like you do on the command line. Um, but you as well can use system variables with these g-string-like notation. You can just access the home ver system variable. And you even can define system variables with these name of this variable var1 is value1, for example. And var2 is value2, for example. So you can do almost th the things that you want to do. And after that, you just write groovy. Good world. But unfortunately, that does not work on Linux. It works on macOS. It works on FreeBSD, but not on Linux, or only partially. Um, the problem is that the and or the the arguments that you have behind these here behind these env all these, is given to the env, or whatever is treated there, is given as one string, including spaces. On macOS and uh, FreeBSD, there it is separated in multiple arguments, separated by uh, the space sign. Because of that, Linux has the problem that it cannot understand these long string. So. I did a bit of tweaking, doing an alternative script that you can use for that. Uh, with what I didn't put in there, I think it would be possible, of, but I'm not so much the bash monkey. Um, what it doesn't do currently is that I can define variables, but more often you have to use or want to have um, to read and use system variables. So if you're interested, just take this and save it somewhere, for example, in slash home, slash username, slash env, or wherever, and then you can do almost the same stuff like that. So just to your path of your env, and then you can do the same like this. This works. So this is just a little hack. Another hack just came to my attention yesterday evening, because we had a small email as uh, a thread on the Groovy mailing list. This came to the rescue for today, just in time delivery. Thanks to Jochen Theodor who just sent the email this morning to me. And this is a strange situation, but we just used this bin bash as normally. So we used the bash. And bash has the strange behavior that um, if you have two slashes in front, it just shrinks them to a single one. So that means if we just combine these one to one, then we just have, okay, the first, uh, the first thing that you have to call in here is call the user bin env with these arguments, but through bash. And bash is separating all these arguments by space, as you would do in a command line. So. This is what we want to have, or what we would need. Um, what this does is just, OK, execute my env, and then call Groovy. You as well can leave path to Groovy away, I think. And then it's taking the $0. This is just the name of this file I'm currently in. So this means just execute this file with the Groovy executable and give any arguments that had given to the script as well here as arguments, and then exit my bash session stuff. So from this point on, bash doesn't do anything anymore, but gives all the power to the groovy because it's calling the groovy executable. Then groovy reads this file, and groovy has, the on the first line, it sees, oh, there's a comment. This is a special shebang comment. Find comment, throw it away. And then second line, oh, they have a line comment because it's starting with two slashes. It's ignoring this line again. So now we're just in normal groovy power again in our world. So this is really, it's a hack, but I think it's a nice one. So you could even add some other things. For example, specifying and using system variables. You just have to do it before that. Just say, okay, 
use the bin true, this is normally just doing nothing, but you would need that to make it work. And then export class path, whatever you want to specify there. Or export opts and export whatever. What you would do with the env command directly. And then just execute it. And if you, if you know the path, and there you would need the real path to Groovy, um, you don't need this env there. You can just specify the, um, the name of the Groovy executable. So this can be used. With that, you have the chance to just put this shell script somewhere and can be picked up from servers or your colleagues and you can use that wherever they want to. Um, I don't think we have this, have a chance to do that on Windows machines, um, but okay, so it's not my fault. Another very useful thing that we could use is the Groovy serve. Groovy serve is existing for a long time now. It's a project that's running a Java or preparing a Java virtual machine in the background and delegating the scripts you execute to this daemon in the background because warming up or starting the virtual machine just takes a time. And very often we don't want to have a long time waiting for executing shell scripts. We're using, we type it, okay, and then it works. Um, you can uh, reduce this time very much using Groovy serve. So you have faster startup. It's about 10 to 20 times faster, it's especially for small scripts. How could you install that or what, how do you use that? Very easy. On the Windows, there you're very on the safe side because it's just part of the Groovy installer, the Windows Groovy installer. You just have Groovy serve installed with it. On Linux, simple way is uh, GVM. GVM install Groovy serve and you're done. Uh, with Mac you have brew, brew install, Groovy serve and you're done as well. You can as well do it on the binary package, just unzip it somewhere and um, export or put it to the path, the bin, uh, bin directory to the path. So it's not really difficult. How do you use that? Very easy. Instead of calling Groovy, you just call Groovy client. It's just another executable. And if the backend daemon is not running, it's just st starting at the first time and then it's idling in the background. And if you call Groovy client the next time, it's just looking as there's some daemon in the background. Oh yes, just give it and that's it. You can even use that with the env as we have seen there. And you can even use that with the double slash hack we just saw. So this is just how we execute. But you know how to write Groovy, but uh, sometimes there are things that are a bit tricky if you want to interact with the out of Groovy world, the system world. So just some tips and ideas of uh, how to write your scripts. First of all, we have one restriction. Um, and the restriction is if you want to call another class that is another script, not in this file, but in another file, then this class and the file name have to match, like the old Java system. You know, in Groovy, it doesn't matter which file name and the, the class name. Um, in this case, you would need that. It's the same restriction that you have for the Groovy template engine, I think. Um, but if you do that, it's no problem just to put different class files in the same folder and you can just use that as you would normally do. Um, beside from that, normally you, you can do anything you can do uh, from the GUI world. And if you want to execute something outside of your script, for example, a make dear command, okay, you could do it GUI way, but just for a simple example, then we have this nice thing that the string method has the execute method. Uh, the string object has the execute method. Um, so it's just executing that on the shell and waiting for the result. You as well have this on a list, so you can add, if you have arguments, sometimes nicer not to put it into a string separated by spaces, but um, to have a list with the, all the arguments, especially if an argument has a space inside, like here, my directory. 
um, then it's escaping it uh, and separating clearly. So you can just execute a list. This means it's just concatenating the arguments before given to the system. If you want to specify your work directory and the environment around them, that's sometimes as well a bit unusual. First of all, the execute method could take two arguments. Um, the first thing are environment variable for this executed command. I will look to that later on. And the second one is the working directory this, this command should be executed. Well, yeah, very easy, just give it a file and you're fine. Um, if you want to specify these arguments here, right, var one and two, um, the strange thing here is it's a list of strings, and these strings have the key and value separated by the equal sign. It's not that you have a map for, for example. This is what we want, would like to have, but this is not currently in the ex um, execute command. I'm just thinking about adding that to Groovy, but that's another thing. Um, what we could do is a little Groovy feature using what we already have is, okay, let's do a map and then say, okay, maybe, who knows the asterisk notation for map literals with a star? No? It's very easy. If you have the key in a map literal, if the key is a star, a asterisk, this means, uh, and the value is another map, then it's copying all the contents of the other map into this map. So this is just the take all out of this map and put it with the same keys in my map. So this means, A, just take everything that's in system get env, so the environment variables we have, put it in my map, and then I can modify it, for example, add another thing, and then I do collect over that to create this silly strange string, and then I'm good to go. So after executing, very often I want to have a result, I want to work with this result. How can I get hand of that? For example, if I do this ls command and execute it, then I have the method of get text. So I can just do dot text to get the result that this command spit out. And it's a string, I can do everything what I want to do with it in the GUI world. Um, for example here, and this is one thing that you have to do in Windows areas, very often that you have to prepend it with the cmd slash c. If you do Windows command scripting, it's very often you would need something like that. Because the dir command, for example, is a command that from the command shell, and it's now executable in the file system that could be executed. Um, Sometimes you don't want to have it as one string, but you want to have it, as a, have it as an input string. For example, to iterate over each line. Okay, there's a get input stream method there, and then you do what you can do with an input stream. For example, call the each line and do something with each lines. Um, there's a shortcut for input stream. This is the dot in for simplifying accessing. And as well, we have the error stream. You can call it error stream or just error, E double R. And you can use as well as well use the Java process builder for that. So for more complex things, for example, if you want to have functionality that uh, you want to redirect all the um, all that's written to the error stream, that should be written to the same stream that the um, the input stream, so the normal what you normally would see on your shell. So both streams have the same target. And you can do that with this process builder, with the command, and then call this redirect error stream to, with true, and then start it. This is the same. Then you get everything on the input stream. And the error stream is just empty. It will never get anything. This is helpful sometimes. If you want to have control over the process flow, um, can just take the, uh, the result of the execute is just a process object, normal Java process object. So there you can 
execute in Groovy, have this or in normal as well, can execute the wait for. This means, okay, execute this command and wait until it is finished. The get text method has a wait for implicit in there. So it waits for you. You don't have to call it. Um, after that, I can just read the exit value. I have this process variable there. Now I have an exit value, and I can't do anything with that. Um, you as well could do that inline like that, be a bit more readable or compressed, as you like to. And very often you have this situation that you have a command that could run forever, and you would like to have a timeout for that. And Groovy added these wait for or kill function to the process object. This means execute it, wait until it is done, or until these timeout in millisecond, uh, milliseconds had been finished. So another thing is sometimes you have to kill an external process because you have a lo long running process and it took too long or it did something and want, now want to kill it, just execute the destroy method. This works good. The output of a process here um, could be spell handle like that. I take the execute from the process and just create two string buffer buffers and then call the wait for process output. This is a method that is waiting for anything that's coming to the output and writing it to these string builders that I put there. And after that, I can handle that. So this is just a shortcut for waiting anything that, until anything is sent into the streams and catch that. Um, sometimes you want to wait for that, but you don't need to handle the, uh, uh, the output in the streams. So therefore, there we have this consume process output. And this is especially on Windows machines. It is important to do so because um, the, the streams, these are caching stuff and just writing or flashing the stuff in blocks. And you have just short output. Uh, it could happen that you have a deadlock because you're waiting for an output or waiting for it to finish, but the, f the block hadn't been full enough to write something to the outlook. output. So you have this consume process output method that's just, okay, Ignore these as well if the buffer is full or it is too small for that. Just throw it away and then do the wait for. So if you ever have a deadlock situation, try to use the consume process output if you don't need it. It will help, especially Windows. I had this for multiple times. On shell, you're used to something like piping, piping commands. You can do the same in Groovy. Um, you can say, okay, execute these less, and then pipe these less to this grab command. Execute that as well, and then wait for result. So this is um, how you could write that in, in Groovy, in Groovy hmm? things. Normally, we do it less temp, pipe sign, grab detected. This is in Groovy syntax. Um, you can do it a bit more like that, yeah, like that, process, pipe, process. But you can only do that on processes. This is not so nice in this. You cannot, cannot do it with the strings alone, so you have to just call the execute. The, um, the result is the processes object, and if you want to do that in line, you just have to uh, surround it with, with brackets, round brackets. Then it works as well. Another thing you are used to from the shell world is using wildcards, asterisks and question marks. But this is a little problem that this, unfortunately, wouldn't work. Because the asterisk functionality is a functionality of the shell, so of bash. It's not a functionality of the operating system. Because of that, if you want to have this to work, and just execute it on the, on the shell. CMD slash C or CMD minus C, uh, CH minus C. Um, 
Then the command is executed in the shell, so the asterisk risks are working, and you're fine. This is something you have to think about. So, because there's so many things that are so you have to remind and remember, I just wrote a small shell helper to put that together. Turn that. Ah, there I get the system environment, and so I have this something like that. I can put my environment in there as a map, as we would expect it, and later on, and then I as well can specify the directory, the working directory, and as well can say, do I want to redirect my error stream like that? And as well, setting a timeout for waiting for all this stuff. And then I have my execute method. So it's kind of small DSL for that. And feel free to use that in every situation you want to. And as a shortcut, execute is one way. The other thing is um, the call method. Um, and you know, maybe you know, if you have any object in Groovy and this has a call method, you can just add the brackets to execute the call method. You don't have to write my object dot call. You as well can just do my object brackets with arguments, as you would call closures or any other uh, or a method. So, and this is the real function that is doing the magic because the execute is just executing the process and the call as well is waiting. So depending what you want to, you can call the one or the others. And as for simplifying life, because you would need it very often, you can use the each line method to iterate over the output. So this is just a small helper for simplifying life, but then you can do stuff like that. Okay, I have my shell helper, it's called shell in this case, and then I say, okay, call this one, call that one, and this, or do this in the directory. In this directory, please call this. Or do for each line, please ex uh, of this command, execute that, print that, or like that. So these are just some examples for how you could use Groovy to simplify your life that you don't have to remind, oh, I have to think about that and that and that. Other helpful stuff for um, working with, with Groovy sh uh, command shell scripts is, for example, accessing the system variables. Now we have the system env. Um, even if the system env in Java has a small e, it just works with the normal dot env. Um, so system.env gives a map of all the uh, of all the values, so you can just say system.env.pwd and you get your current working directory. Um, the system properties is for system.properties and the same thing. If you have any properties that have some strange characters like dots or spaces or whatever, you used to do that in Groovy, just put it into, I uh, don't know the name, you know what I mean, these small things about there. Um, so, sometimes you have the need to get the PID, so the process ID of the process you just called. To get hold of that, you can use a b the management factory of the, of the MX Bean stuff. So, get management factory runtime MX Beans for the current um, executable, then get the name and split it by the at sign and then take the first part. It's not nice, but it works. Um, so this is uh, more the, I would say, the baseline stuff. Then we have some libraries or um, other functionality in Groovy world that would be really nice to use. One of them is the client, uh, the CLI builder. Because in shell scripting, you very often you get arguments into your script and you want to parse that from the argument line with minus minus something and so on. Um, and the CLI builder exists as well for a long time now. It's very handy for that. So you can just say, okay, create my CLI builder instance and give my help or my usage string um, what's later on in the help. Or if I have an exception, then I get a list of what 
is able, the man page like or the help part, um, this will be created automatically. So this is the usage string. So my script in this case, and then I have this CLI.with or take inside of this um, builder, can use the builder syntax with v for this is the minus v argument, so the short version of an argument, in this case minus v. And then I can specify a long option if it has, for example, the minus minus version stuff, and a description for that. And later on, I just can say, okay, cli.parse, and it's parsing the arguments that I give the arguments that I get from outside of my script. The args is, in a normal script, this args is predefined by what the script or what the main method got as arguments. Okay, and then I can just say, okay, if I have no options, then just exit. The interesting thing is, if I have something like that, so I have a problem, a real error, so it could not parse, and something is really wrong, then the help page is showed automatically. So in this case, you already have, uh, the system has printed the, the help page. So, and after that, I just can say, okay, if my option has a V option, then do something. Print the version, for example. This is a simple example, a bit more complicated, or this is the, uh, the, the help script that is created automatically. Um, so, here's my usage, and then the arguments, and here my list. What is able, so, uh, but this is not what I currently did, or just did, or showed. This is what we want to do now. It's a bit more complicated because we have this minus question mark that is very um, often used in Windows world, not so in the POSIX world. Then the minus minus help. Then you have another case where you don't have a short version, just have a long version. So how do you specify that? Um, then as well you have arguments that could be additionally said. Um, or some properties like the minus D flag from, from Java, so you know that. Now, how could you handle that? And so on. Especially, for example, I have a long name like source, but just with a single minus sign, and so on. So, just a short skip through. This is the CLI builder for that. I just do, no, take this, it's easy for me. Um, first, take this source stuff. This means minus source with a single minus, because this is the short version. Short versions are just executed with a single dash. Okay, then it has arguments, one argument. And the argument name, this is used here in the help, uh, yeah, on the page before, there and here, arg or path, yeah. Um, this is the name for the argument to show, and is it optional or not? Okay, and then you have some text information. The second one is, if you don't have a short version, so we have this example here with the minus minus config that doesn't have a short command. You just use the underscore. Underscore is just a fallback if you don't have a short. So and then you have to specify the long option, arguments, and whatever you want to do. Additionally, the, the, no, the most used case is the minus s, and the long is the minus minus source, as well with the other arguments. Um, and for this question mark, if you have, because question mark is no valid method name in Groovy, just put it in, um, yeah, just forgot. You know what I mean, here. Uh, single quotes, yes, right. Um, here the same for version. This has no arguments, so don't specify, in this case, don't specify the args, so this has no arguments. And this is the way how you specify this strange minus D stuff. Okay, the same minus D has two arguments, but I have a value separator. So it's separating the values automatically for me by this minus, uh, by the, the equal sign, and um, giving me that as two arguments. So this is just the parsing or definition of the parsing, and then just parse it. Okay, parse it if I had a problem show me the help page is automatically so I can exit. So and then handle all the options. For example, first one, if I have this question mark, then just do usage. This is the same than the help, shown the help page. 
This is doing it manually. Or next thing is if I have a V option, okay, call, uh, print the version number. Next thing, if it's not that, but if I have a config option, if I don't have a short version, I just use the, short, uh, the long version for asking or for que question, querying the opt or the options. I uh, can do that for the others as well. So not only f if I don't have a short version, even you can always use the long version to query it. Um, and if you have these minus D, where we have these path separated stuff, I can do that as well if I have D as options. Then I can just have these strange Ds. So it's always adding an S after that. So this contains the arguments of these um, separate stuff. Um, because, you know, you can have multiple arguments of minus D that, minus D that, minus D that. So these are multiples of that. And then I can say, OK, collate that into two, um, into lists of two. Because the problem is you get one big list with the first value key of the first, then the value and then the key of the second, and then the value and the key of the third, and so on. So you have, for three options, you have six entries in the list. So just collate it in a list containing lists with two elements. That's just the collate method. Then you can collect it, join it with the equal sign, for example, and print it in this case. Um, or another thing here, for example, for the sources, I just get my user directory from the properties. And then I can say, OK, if I have an S or a source, then just access it via the same thing. Because it's not really a Boolean. Yes, it has something. But if it has something, it gives me the value. And you know, for example, a string that is not empty, this is true. So. You can use that in the, in the if statement. So this is what you can do. And if you have any other arguments that are after these parsed, arg these named arguments, for example, a file that's coming after that, all the rest is in the result of the arguments method of the options. So you can iterate over it, for example, and handle that. So with this, Client builder, CS, CLI builder, it's really handy to use that. It's, you can use that from, from, it's an Apache project, I think. You can use that from Java as well, but the Groovy DSL on top of that is really nice and powerful. So what's the time currently? Uh, we have time up to? Eight minutes. OK, so before the questions, just one thing won't explain it, just for you to look up. Because of that, I put it in the last, because I had the feeling that it wouldn't take time. But another helpful thing is the dependent management in Groovy. And I think many of them could use that. It's the grape stuff, the, um, the add grab annotations. Um, I will put my slides on SlideShare there at the end after the question page is contained. That's very interesting to use that if you don't know that. It's very helpful to have really this dependent management on your shell script as well to use that. It's one of the power features, but a bit too long for this talk. So are there any questions from your side? Yeah? Uh, if you're using the uh, Ruby sub, uh, you know, isn't that a security issue? Because that would run with the uh, rights of that daemon, not the that user. Um, as far as I know, the daemon is started as the user that started it the first time. So if you are running the groovy client command first time as root, then it's running as root. So then it would be a security risk like, like that. And, um, but if you're running as your user, what you normally do on desktop machines like that, then it's just running in this context, so the, this security stuff. As well, I don't know how long it is, but after a, some time of idling, like the groovy daemon as well, if it's just idling for some time, then it shuts off itself a, an hour, I think, or something like that. So it's a long time, but so that it's not always taking the time, time, and then back. But I think this is the only thing that I have thinking about. Do I want to start that as 
route, this could be the only problem. Any other questions? Yeah? Is it the same uh, demon as the Grail use? Mm, as far as I know, no. It is not the same thing, but it's inspired by GroovySurf. So GroovySurf had been first, and um, then Gradle re-implemented that, and I think they used some kind of part of the code, but as well re uh, did a new re-implementation of that for their purpose, because the Gradle daemon is doing some other stuff internally and it's more t tailored to the needs of, Gra of Gradle, where the GroovySurf is a general Groovy execution engine. Any other questions? So if not, I'm here for the rest of the conference. If the comes, questions comes up, I uh, thank you very much for your attention and audience. I wish you a nice conference. So bye. <laughs>